Finals SAQ 66, Critical Illness Weakness, CIW. A. Define critical illness weakness and list the types that may occur. CIW is clinically detectable, symmetrical, peripheral, not involving cranial nerves, thus facial sparing, weakness in critically ill patients that is not pre-existing, i.e. it develops after the onset of critical illness and is not attributable to a primary neurologic cause. It is defined by standard muscle strength testing with MRC strength testing scale. One way of assessing for CIW is for the upper extremity, assessment of wrist flexion, forearm flexion and shoulder abduction, and lower extremity, ankle dorsiflexion, knee extension and hip flexion, and score for each movement according to MRC scale. A score of less than 48 in total is suggestive of ICU-associated weakness. CIW types include critical illness polyneuropathy, critical illness myopathy, and critical illness neuromyopathy. B. List the risk factors for the development of weakness in the ICU. Non-modifiable risk factors include severity of illness, higher illness severity score, systemic inflammation or sepsis, multi-organ failure, prolonged mechanical ventilation, prolonged critical illness, and high lactate. Demographics includes female sex, old age, multiple comorbidities, and obesity. Modifiable risk factors include hyperglycemia, parenteral nutrition, drugs such as vasoactive medications, corticosteroids, neuromuscular blockers, certain antibiotics such as aminoglycosides and vancomycin, and sedatives, leading to prolonged bed rest and immobilization. C. What are the clinical features of CIW? This includes weakness that has developed after the onset of critical illness, generalized symmetrical flaccid weakness, usually sparing the cranial nerves, there may be associated sensory loss but not autonomic involvement, other causes have been excluded, such as stroke, infectious diseases, hypoglycemia, spinal cord injuries, demyelinating diseases, myasthenia gravis and Guillain-Barre syndrome, and dependence on mechanical ventilation or low muscle strength. D. How may nerve conduction studies determine the type of CIW? This table compares critical illness polyneuropathy and critical illness myopathy. For compound motor action potential, amplitude, this is decreased for both. CMAP duration is normal for critical illness polyneuropathy and is increased in critical illness myopathy. Sensory nerve action potential, SNAP amplitude, is decreased for critical illness polyneuropathy and is normal for critical illness myopathy. Nerve conduction velocity is normal or near normal for both. EMG at rest shows fibrillation potentials or positive sharp waves for both. Other parameters are listed here for completion. E. What are the options for the management of CIW? This includes avoidance of risk factors, avoiding hyperglycemia, intermittent and targeted sedation, Minimization of corticosteroids. Minimize the duration of mechanical ventilation, for example, by minimizing sedation and daily spontaneous breathing trials. Avoid early parenteral nutrition. Physiotherapy from time of admission to ICU and during recovery. Early mobilization program. Optimal timing, duration, intensity and composition of an early rehabilitation program has not been established. Use of a mobility protocol rather than simply having a culture of early mobilization has been associated with patients achieving higher levels of mobilization. This is an example of a mobility protocol. These are designed to safely advance patients to different levels of therapeutic exercise as their condition tolerates. Level 1 begins with passive range of motion. Level 2 initiates a sitting position. Level 3 mobilizes a patient to sitting on the edge of bed, and level 4 initiates transfer out of bed, or ambulating. More than a dozen studies to date have examined the safety of early mobility. Adverse effects are reported infrequently during the thousands of therapy sessions in these studies. Benefits of early mobilization program includes improved functional outcomes, increased muscle strength and endurance, improved neurocognitive outcomes, reduced hospital dependence, and improved long-term outcomes 
such as reduced readmissions and death. Contraindications for early mobilization includes CVS, evidence of active myocardial ischemia, hypotension, new or escalating vasopressor requirement, hypertensive emergencies, and uncontrolled arrhythmias. Respiratory contraindications includes SpO2 less than 88%, more than 3 minutes during mobility, and requirement of high levels of oxygen or PEEP. Other specific contraindications include active GI bleed, increased ICP, uncontrolled seizures and spinal precautions. Early mobilization may be performed by ICU nurses, physical or occupational therapists, dedicated mobility team, and respiratory therapists. Barriers to early mobilization include institutional, patient level and provider level barriers. Institutional barriers include lack of institutional protocols or guidelines for mobilization, insufficient equipment or financial support, and insufficient staffing. Patient level barriers include medical instability, excessive sedation, lines and tubes. Provider level barriers include lack of knowledge about early mobility, safety concerns, and delays in recognition of patients who are appropriate for early mobility. Measures that lack benefit include neuromuscular electrical stimulation and drugs. Overall, 30.4% pass rate. CEA, CCP, and BJA education articles are basically college-approved opinion on a topic. Make good use of them. An article on ICU-acquired weakness was published in 2012. Additional questions. How common is ICU-acquired weakness? This is very common with incidents reported in up to 25 to 100% of patients depending on the population. What's the pathophysiology of ICU-acquired weakness? The pathophysiology is incompletely understood. Penhorbic I et al. presented a conceptual framework in 2020 to show the major pathways that are assumed to be involved in the loss of muscle mass and loss of muscle function that contribute to the development of ICU-acquired weakness. Factors increasing muscle atrophy includes neuroendocrine alterations, increased catabolism, reduced anabolism, immobilization, disuse, unloading, mechanical ventilation, and functional denervation. Factors that reduce muscle function include alteration in muscle structure, such as necrosis, inflammation, and presence of adipocytes or fibrosis, neuronal damage and dysfunction, impact perfusion and oxygen delivery, inflammation, hyperglycemia, leading to mitochondrial dysfunction, increased oxidative damage, accumulation of damaged organelles and proteins, due to insufficient autophagy, changes in membrane and ion channel function, leading to muscle or nerve membrane hypoexcitability and disturbed excitation contraction coupling. What are the various methods for diagnosing ICU-acquired weakness? Methods to assess peripheral muscles include volitional functional testing, electrophysiology, imaging, and biopsy analysis. Examples of volitional functional testing include MRC sum score, handheld dynometry, scored physical function in intensive care test, functional status score for the ICU, Chelsea critical care physical assessment tool, and 6-minute walk test. Examples for electrophysiology includes full nerve conduction studies and needle electromyography, single nerve conduction study, or direct muscle stimulation. Imaging options include ultrasonography, CT scan, MRI, dual energy x-ray, absorptiometry, neutron activation analysis, and bioelectrical impedance measurements. Nerve and muscle biopsies may be performed. Options to assess respiratory muscles include volitional functional testing. Examples include maximal inspiratory and expiratory pressure and transdiaphragmatic pressure. Non-volitional functional testing includes transdiaphragmatic pressure in response to bilateral twitch phrenic nerve stimulation and endotracheal tube pressure in response to bilateral phrenic nerve stimulation during airway occlusion. Imaging options include chest x-rays and ultrasonography. What are the short-term and long-term complications that are associated with intensive care unit acquired weakness? Short-term complications include increased mortality, increased ICU or hospital length of stay, 
increased in-hospital costs, increased duration of mechanical ventilation, higher risk for extubation failure, and increased risk of swallowing disorders. Long-term complications include increased post-ICU mortality, increased risk of discharge to other hospital or rehabilitation centre, increased duration of rehabilitation, and reduced physical functioning. These are my references. Thank you.